Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Coast to Coast. My name is Lillian Corral, and I'm joined by my colleague, Lily Weinberg. Hi, Lily. Hi. How are you, Lillian? I'm good. How are you doing? Um, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Um, yeah. It's, you know, I, I, I know um, we've talked over the past few weeks, um, and um, I'll just share a, a few thoughts about Miami and, and what's happening across the, the country. Um, Miami has had largely peaceful demonstrations um, over the city over the past couple of weeks. Um, personally, I have been deeply moved by the demonstrations against systemic racism in Miami and across our night cities. Um, I have checked in um, with the cities that I personally work with, um, 18 small to mid-sized markets across the country. And Lillian, you can name it. Um, we have rural, urban, purple, red, blue, everything in between. And every single one, even the smallest, Aberdeen, South Dakota, um, have participated day after day in the demonstrations against these racial injustices. Um, and Alberto wrote um, the response, and if we can link to that statement that he wrote, the, the quote, roar um, that we hear um, is the sound of an engaged community. Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, how is LA? Well, I was going to say, I mean, it's been two weeks since we've, um, since we've done the show, and it does feel like um, the world is completely different, which is, um, which is, it's so, it seems like it's part of this wave that we've been um, sort of navigating um, over the last three to four months. Um, but LA, I think, is like, um, it, 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 Los Angeles feels a lot like what you've described. I think like every major city across the country and across the world, um, I think we, we battle with our own um, history of um, police brutal brutality. And so the city um, has, you know, what started out with a very tumultuous um, uh, set of protests and manifestations has really sort of subsided into just every day, four or five areas across the city um, are the focal point of demonstrations. Um, and people are asking for reform and change. So. Um, so this, you know, this is a really interesting time for us. And in, in a lot of ways, when we thought about developing Coast to Coast Lily, like this is exactly why we, we decided to do this show, because we wanted to talk about what was happening in our communities. We never imagined that, um, that this was uh, going to be one of, our, um, one of our focal points. But um, we, we, we wanted to talk about what was happening in our communities and how we could share tools and resources for building more engaged communities. So, so tell people about Coast to Coast for those that are new to the show. Um, and then let's get into this topic yeah. and the conversation with our guests. Absolutely. Sounds great. Um, and, and so for Coast to Coast, we are looking at the future of cities. Um, you know, what Lillian said, um, especially um, for building engaged communities in a time of rapid change. Um, I, I can't really think of a, of a better time to be um, looking at this. Um, we started by doing a deep dive um, on public spaces and really looking at the transformation of parks and streets. Um, we'll be moving slowly into mobility and technology. Um, but but Lillian, and, and you know this um, over and over and over again, um, equity and inclusion um, keeps on coming up and, and is really um, at, at the forefront. Um, and, and I just want to, I just want to say one more thing. I, I want to iterate um, what you um, said, Lillian. Um, we aren't just talking. Um, we are looking for actionable, tangible ideas and takeaways for our audience of practitioners. So yeah. tell us what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, so today we have, we're joined by Jai Winston, um, our colleague at Knight Foundation, who leads the St. Paul office, and Tony Newborn, who is the Chief Equity Officer for the City of St. Paul. Um, and so what's great is Jai um, will bring in, Jai has an investment and a finance and a community building background um, mixed with politics that I think lends a really strong perspective to this moment. And then Tony is leading everything um, that has to do with equity with the city of St. Paul, who's really been looking at this issue over the last couple of years. She leads the city's equity steering committee, the equity design team, um, and the department equity change teams. Um, to really guide and integrate equity into the city services, engagement policies, and practices. So thank you, Jai and Tony, for making time to join us today. Um, first, uh, just let's set some context for the conversation today, and then also um, encourage our audience to participate. Um, 
so uh, for um, for the audience, we just want to make sure you know that we want you we want to hear your questions too. So please um, look for the Q and A box um, if you're joining us via Zoom and share your questions with us. We'll be fielding those questions and 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 addressing them later on in the show. And then for those of you who may be joining us either through Facebook Live or if you want to use um, Twitter to share some questions on Facebook Live, please share your questions. We'll be looking at that as well. And then on Twitter, um, if you use the hashtag Night Live, we'll be looking to field those questions as well. Um, so Jai and Tony, um, today we're hoping we go through kind of a little bit of a journey of first just letting us know how is your community doing, how did we get here, and, 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 and what's really been leading up to this moment. There's a lot of positive work that's actually been happening in St. Paul we also want to hear about. Um, and then we want to talk about the kinds of efforts and things that you've been doing over the last couple of years to address some of these issues, which are not new. And, and, how, and where do we go from here? How do we rebuild? How do we recover? We're dealing with multitude of things, right? We, we're dealing with the aftermath um, of George Floyd's death in the region, but we're also dealing with the recovery from this pandemic. Um, and so we really want to talk about that too. So, um, so let's get to it. Jai, um, maybe starting with you, can you tell us a little bit just how are you doing? How is the community doing? Um, and 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 where do you where do you see the community two weeks just barely two weeks after um, the death of George Floyd and the start of um, all of this great manifestation that's been happening? Yeah, so I want to thank you just for the opportunity. So I'll say you know personally, uh, the past two weeks have been pretty challenging, um, feeling a broad range of emotions from being upset, angry, um, disappointed, but at the same time there's a, a sense of hopefulness and optimism. And I had the opportunity to go last Tuesday, and if you guys wouldn't mind sharing that slide, um, to a protest at the state capitol. And it was a really peaceful demonstration, and there were a couple thousand folks out there. And as I was sitting there, as people were making sure everyone's hydrated, making sure people have food, et cetera, it was really nice to just see the community come out in a stand of solidarity. And I think going back to Alberto's statement that you guys might have shown earlier, um, towards the end, he said, our democracy depends on our willingness to try and really talking around the fact that you saw a community come out in this effort to really actively participate in our democratic process. So I will say the community is also still deeply grieving, but at the same time, you know, to see everyone coming together to really move the needle forward, you know, to have a more equitable and just society, but particularly community, it's been really heartwarming. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we all feel that, as, as Lily mentioned too, it's like it's amazing to see how much this issue is really just cut across all communities and people are just standing up um, together. Um, Tony, is there something that surprised you? Please uh, first welcome and, um, and is there something that has surprised you the most about the reaction um, to George Floyd's death, not just in the US, but even globally? Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, what I think what surprised me the most, you said globally, is that it became a global issue and uh, seeing folks in London um, yeah. protesting, seeing people uh, even in greater Minnesota, you know, which, you know, from a stereotypical standpoint, folks think are, you know, uh, wouldn't be involved in a protest like this, wouldn't be involved in, in um, you know, uh, fighting for, for justice. Um, the, the impact that this, this Midwestern city of, uh, of Minnesota and and the largest city in, in, in Minnesota to have on the rest of the world. Uh, I think that surprised me the most. Uh, we've seen so much, unfortunately, we've, we've seen so much death and, and killings of uh, the African American, um, our African American black men. And, you know, people usually rally around, you may have a few protests here and there, maybe a few more states across the, the country and cities across the country. But for it to be global, that was, I think that's been the most uh, surprising um, aspect of, of this response. Yeah, I mean, it definitely, right, um, reminds us that this is not a unique situation and it's not unfortunately unique to, to the area, to the city, um, to the time. Um, Jai, can you give us a little bit of framing about St. Paul and how we got to this point? Um, I know that you've shared a lot with us about how um, the city's been changing, um, you know, and so can you can you sort of give us a little bit of that context for folks who are not as familiar with with the region? Yeah, absolutely. And if there's a slide too that I think you guys can point to just that shows a little bit of the population, the demographic shift. 
But I think it's important to understand the history kind of of St. Paul. So roughly in the 1930s, you had the Rondo neighborhood, which is a very affluent, thriving black community. And around the 1950s, 60s, similarly that we've seen happen in many other cities across the country, particularly around communities of color, when they were building out the interstate, they went through the black community where they had other options, but they chose to go through that black community. And so we still see those long-standing ramifications today, particularly around them not being able to have generational wealth. And in addition to that, I think that it created an underpinning of a lot of racial tension. And so that compounded with all of these other injustices over the years that this community has experienced, particularly with the demographic shift where we have a very large Somali and Hmong population. And from our state demographer's office, the most recent ethnographic study shows that St. Paul is now a majority minority city. So the challenge and the tension that's always been there, but I think getting like bigger and bigger has been that they are not represented. Local city government doesn't necessarily reflect the demographic shift. And so I think all of these things have kind of brought it to a boil. And I think, you know, when I moved in to, when I moved to St. Paul in 2016, it was on the heels of Orlando Castile shooting. So that was something that was a very deep wound for this community in St. Paul. And I think recently what we've seen with George Floyd, I think that was really, you know, the expression, the straw that broke the camel's back. I think you saw the community really pushing back and saying, you know, enough is enough. Tony, I don't know if you want to add any more um, context or, or, or history to what Jai shared. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think uh, Jai was spot on about uh, the, the history of, of Rondo. I mean, we've seen that happen in our, our, our uh, Black community. You know, if we go, go, go back, you know, 100 or so years uh, with our uh, American Indian Native community, um, we've seen, you know, the, the, you know, from possibly from their perspective, you know, the removal of, of, of land and its understanding of, who, of, of land ownership. Um, you know, when we talk about, you know, I, I'm originally from the South and from Birmingham, Alabama. And, uh, you know, a lot of times folks think, oh, all of those bad things around racism and discrimination and bias happened and uh, in, in the South only, but, you know, Minnesota and the, the Midwest and, and all over the country, there are incidences of happening uh, and it may not have been ratified or enacted by law, but uh, it, was a, it was a practice of, uh, of these areas in which there was a se separation and segregation of, of you know, whites and, and, and uh, people of color and specifically black. Uh, I think about the, the most recent um, documentary around uh, the Jim Crow North. And you know, while it's a focus on, on um, Minneapolis, there's some work uh, that is being done here in St. Paul to look at those uh, covenants, those racial covenants. Uh, for uh, around housing and you know a lot of we we think about like oh, wh why are our cities so segregated why you know why is it that a lot a large uh, or significant number of uh, African Americans live in Rondo or live in North Minneapolis or you know live in on the east side of St. Paul well it was it was designed that way and uh, you know there was the, these covenants that were in place that uh, directed and, and, and there was an agreement, contractual agreement that said only whites would live in this area, only blacks or and at that time Negroes would live in, in uh, certain areas and Jews were uh, permitted in certain areas or allowed to uh, purchase homes. So um, we, have a, we have a strong uh, a, and a long history of, of discrimination and, and anti-blackness or anti-fill-in-the-blank non-white uh, in, in the state of Minnesota and of course across the country and it's not just, uh, just it wasn't just happening in the South. Yeah, no, definitely. So um, uh, I think, I mean, it's, it sounds like we have at least some, some, some context here for, for how we got to this moment and, and what's been happening. Uh, let's, Lily, why don't you um, take over and let's talk a little bit about like how, you know, how, how, you, how you've actually been trying to address these issues, because the great yeah. thing in St. Paul is that you have been actually working on this. Change has been slow, but it's been coming. Right, and in and, um, and the city of, of St. Paul, the, the new administration with Mayor Carter has done some really interesting work um, around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we'll, we'll dive into that um, because we have a lot of, of course, practitioners in our, in our audience. Um, so Tony, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, this administration has put in a lot of measures to date um, to address diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so, so first, let's start with um, learning more about your, your 
position, um, chief equity officer. Um, what does that mean, and 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 what do you do? And 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 may I ask um, to please link to um, more details about about the position too. So Tony, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry, taking myself off of mute. Um, yes, uh, Chief Equity Officer, I've been in this position uh, going on now three years. I started with uh, Mayor Carter in uh, 2018 um, as a Chief Equity Officer and the first Chief Equity Officer for the City of St. Paul. Um, uh, at that time that my position was created, there were more um, equity officer positions um, starting to pop up across the country in government. And that's a key, um, it's a distinction, um, key distinction because there, uh, there are a lot of positions in corporations, large corporations for chief diversity or chief inclusion officers um, in the corporate sector or private sector, but not as much in, in government. Um, and so starting to see at that time in 2018, starting to see those positions um, uh, pop up. The um, pillars of our administration for the city of St. Paul is uh, lifelong learning or education, um, uh, economic justice and public safety. And the values of the city of St. Paul are equity um, resiliency and innovation. And the mayor and deputy mayor, Mayor Carter and deputy mayor Tencher decided um, that they wanted positions in their administration to reflect the values of the city. And so we have a chief equity officer position, we have a chief uh, innovation officer position and a chief resiliency officer. Um, you know, I was fortunate when I um, uh, started in this role that the city already had an equity, diversity and inclusion framework and I inherited that framework and was able to centralize it to making an office of one. Um, and I apologize, my uh, clock is in the background <laughs> here. But uh, so uh, an office or position of one and my job is to uh, ensure, and this is very a basic response at least for, for right now, but to ensure that our policies, practices and procedures are viewed through an equity lens. And I work with our, from an internal standpoint with our departments, um, there are 14 operating departments across the city. And uh, I work with those departments in our, what we call our equity change teams to ensure that we have a work plan, uh, which has goals. And I work with those departments to help them to achieve those goals around uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And uh, provide space for us to, uh, whether from a training standpoint, um, providing uh, training or working with consultants across the city and state uh, for, for training, but uh, to ensure that uh, we're viewing all of our work uh, and they truly mean all of our work through that, that equity lens. We uh, ensure that we're engaging with the community and we're centering the community and our residents of St. Paul and our business owners at the center of this work. And we, um, the work that we are leading and the plans that we're executing are community driven. And uh, so there's an, an, an authentic, equitable engagement component to, to the job. Uh, and then, you know, then I would just do throw in the kitchen sink. Then it's everything else uh, from the in, in internal aspect of working with our, our staff and our city departments. But uh, right now I'm on our um, one of our largest uh, development projects right now in the city is with the, the Ford project, uh, Ford development uh, site, in which we are, um, most folks would say we're building a small city within St. Paul and it's a huge redevelopment. So we have a team comprised of directors uh, and myself to ensure that we have a broad perspective uh, in how we are executing that work. So my work looks, uh, encompasses a lot of things and, and then some things, but it's, it's, it's broad, but it's overall, I would say, serving as a resource and an advisor and a thought per partner, both internally with staff and also externally with our community. That's fantastic. It sounds like you're very busy, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're doing a lot. Um, I just want to unpack a few things uh, that, that you said. So one was, um, I loved how St. Paul very clearly puts forward its values and then has officers lined up to those values. So equity is one of the values and you're the officer leading equity. Um, and then I heard that you know there's it's really two parts. So it's looking internally and then it's also looking externally. So internally you're 
literally you have the lens of equity for every single department, which, which is a huge task. Um, and then externally, it sounds like you're, you're doing a lot of the engagement work. Um, so, so that's, that's, that's really interesting. Again, we did link, um, if you want to learn more about the equity role in the chat box. Um, so Jai, um, I, I want to ask you, I mean, you, you've now been at night for, for many years. Um, and, and you know, you know, all the night cities, um, from your perspective, why is it so important to have a role like this chief? equity officer? Yeah, so I, I think she, Tony summed up quite a lot in terms of, you know, the policies and practices and procedures that in her role she has the opportunity to review, you know, making sure that is reflective of the needs and wants of the residents and their cons constituents, so to speak. And so I think similarly for Knight as a value that we, you know, care about equitable, participatory, and inclusive communities, I think, you know, we are able to support some of that work in a way, but ultimately I think we have to have those partnerships with local city government um, in order to achieve that goal. So residents have the opportunity to reach their full potential. And so I think, you know, I'm extremely grateful to see St. Paul have that role. And my hope is that other cities across the U.S. also are able to, you know, adapt some of those things. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think that the overlap between philanthropy and then also business um, for this role is also really critical. Um, so, so Tony, I, I would love for you to, to, to kind of ground this even more. Um, you talked about the strategy, but I would love for you to ground it in the sense of, um, can you, can you walk us through some of the programs, um, you know, that you've developed to date um, uh, uh, with the, with the current administration? And, and please link um, to uh, an article about the current administration too. Great. Um, so I feel like in, in almost three years, we've just been, we've been running. <laughs> There's so many things, so many programs, so many, so much work that this team uh, has, has done um, under uh, Mayor Carter's leadership. Uh, you know, we started out uh, with, uh, I, I'll start out with our hiring process actually. Um, you know, Mayor Carter uh, uh, really wanted to make sure that when we, uh, by selecting his, his team, his administration, that um, the community was involved in that. And um, so I helped to run a community hiring process for our, uh, our executives at our top level, our directors. And um, as a, as a uh, result of that, that work and engaging the community, we were able to diversify our leadership and uh, this was, we've, we now have the most diverse, and I mean racially diverse, ethnic, um, gender diverse um, team that the city has uh, arguably ever had. And so um, we started out our administration with, from an engagement standpoint, uh, we were able to uh, raise the minimum wage. Um, we uh, uh, created uh, the Office of uh, Financial Empowerment. And that office is leading, and in that office is equity is infused in that office, uh, as with all of our other ones. But the, the premise and purpose of that that team was to ensure that our community members had uh, an opportunity. We could meet them at where they're at from a financial standpoint, and, and provide resources to to our community to whether for those who are unbanked. Um, we started a college savings account in which uh, every child born in St. Paul would receive an, a savings account uh, with $50 in it to go towards, towards college. Um, you know, we have started, uh, the mayor has started uh, and, and asked, um, received a, a, a budget from city council on our community first uh, public safety work. And, you know, this, we were ahead of the game on, um, on that work before George Floyd. Um, now, more than ever, it's important that we put the frame, uh, the, the kind of foundation, built the foundation in that work, because um, the, the way that policing is viewed now and, and how we're seeing policing and law enforcement is, will be different in the future. And so having a community first public safety strategy is going to be important. Um, find uh, the, our libraries, we went find free. And uh, surprisingly enough, uh, that was controversial, and we didn't <laughs> we didn't really think that that would be one of the most controversial topics uh, for the city, especially when you're talking about the library. But we now do not, um, you know, impose fines on our community members for late late books, and there was a lot of data and and resources put into that work to see that the, the folks who were um, uh, had the most fines were folks of color and people who yeah. needed to actually have access to the library. But because they had this $5, $10 fine, 
they were uh, staying away from the, the resource uh, that, that, that they actually needed. And so we've seen uh, over the last year, year and a half, an increase in um, uh, participation and, and coming into the library. And folks are now re-upping, so to speak, their library cards and coming in and utilizing the resources. So that's just a, a brief, uh, you know, overview of, of, of some of the work that, that we've done. I want to uh, thank you, and I, I want to focus on that on the on the fines and fees because I know that you 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 said you got a lot of resistance on that um, in many cities um, that I've worked with um, because I, I love um, that St. Paul got rid of the, the the library fines, and I think other cities you know um, should really look at, at your model. But but there's also a, a practical piece of um, of you know uh, um, how do you offset that revenue um, and and you know um, can you just talk talk practically because I, I know there's a lot of practitioners that are that are saying you know how is this even possible to 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 get rid of fines? Sure, um, you know, so I, I think the misconception is that you know the city the city's goal is not to be a revenue generating piece, especially from a library standpoint. Right. Um, so if we, we shouldn't be for positioning ourselves to generate revenue off of our community not paying fines, uh, especially from the library. And when we did a, an assessment, and these are very um, approximate numbers, uh, but, you know, it was the equivalent of a, a little bit over 200000 Right. And so for the city, that's that's a couple of salary. You know, that's a couple of positions that we have. So it wasn't it's not a ton of money. And uh, so the library department um, with, uh, you know, from a budget standpoint and also just their uh, connections and relationships and grants, they were able to offset that um, fund because the city didn't want to position itself to be a place where, where we're reliant on um, uh, fees uh, from our, our residents and from our community. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and for audience members, if you want to learn more about St. Paul's um, fine and fees work, um, eliminating fines and fees, um, we just linked in the chat box um, about that. But it's, it's, Tony, it's, as you said, it's really about, it's about the community. It's not about, about just gen generating revenue. Um, so, so I'll, I'll close this, this, the, about what's happening in St. Paul. I, I do want to ask um, Jai, um, if you can comment a little bit, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, what do do you see as as the role of, of philanthropy and and business um, uh, as as we as we ground this work in St. Paul? Yeah, I think really underscoring the importance of cross sector collaboration, realizing that you know local city government has its limitations, um, and that philanthropy and business also I think has the opportunity to play the role in being a catalyst on trying innovative, new, creative ways to solve some of the pressing challenging issues that they've been experiencing for years. And so I think an opportunity, particularly when I think about Knight's role and some of the work that we've been able to do is piloting some things and demonstrating and shining a spotlight on it and saying, hey, this works. This is a really new approach that we could do something, a new way to get something done. And then I think being able to put it front and center in front of the city to say, hey, you know, I think you guys should think about reallocating a budget line item towards this initiative, et cetera. And so I think that's something that we've been able to do well. And I think that's worked really well. And the same with business. Business has that same flexibility where I think local city government has a, a bit more constraints around it. Yeah, yeah, so testing mm -hmm. out new ideas. Lillian, you wanna um, take us into the recovery? Yeah, I mean, I think this point about this shifting of the mindset that the city's not a revenue generator is a big one. Um, but, you know, Tony, you were dealing with the, the pandemic recovery even before the George Floyd death. And so um, I, I guess I, what I'm wondering is, how do we actually do this? Um, how do we, how do we, do you have any advice or for how do we actually start to do that shift in thinking? Because for the most part in most cities, these fines and fees, as an example, are really critical to keeping services going. And when we were already looking, I mean, cities were already looking um, because of COVID to a very re reduced tax base and, um, and, and, and pretty bad budget outlooks for the next year or two at least. Um, so how, do you have advice for how do we actually start to create that shift? Is it in roles like yourself or what other things has the leadership of the city really done to make sure that at the departmental level, people understand we need to think about city services in a different way. 
Well, I think, you know, um, having a chief equity officer or a um, equity, diversity and inclusion office in itself is important. Um, and having someone to kind of lead that work and be that thought, per that thought partner uh, at the table, at the leadership table is important because the, the bottom line of this, and this happens throughout all of our work, if you don't have someone leading it, if you don't have someone talking about it or at the table, it's not going to get done. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, there wasn't a chief equity officer position before uh, my position, but the city of St. Paul had a framework, but there were people leading that work and making sure that um, someone was talking about equity, someone would put a, 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 a plan together uh, or, or did some goal setting or tracking data, et cetera. It's, it's important to have people in those, in those spaces. And, uh, you know, intention, um, it's important to, to make sure that you have someone who's that person raising their hand and being intentional around, uh, uh, around this work. Um, so it, it's going to require some level of strategy. That's, yeah, um, no, that, that those are three really good points. It's about, you know, both having someone in that leadership focus uh, role to really make sure that everybody, you know, walks the talk. Um, it seems like there's a bit of measurement. Um, and then it's also, I, I like the point about intention. Um, you know, again, we've had a lot of conversations around equity. There was a conversation, a really interesting one around public spaces. And, um, and we talked about how do we build more equitable public spaces. And a lot of the discussion ended, ended up centering on like trying to make a case for economic development, like, you know, that more equitable public spaces is actually, um, you know, that there's a, there's a revenue uh, uh, component to it. Um, how, how do we, do you have advice and, and Jai from your perspective too as a funder, um, like how can we measure more equitable recoveries or more equitable um, programming? Is it, is it a matter of use? I mean, um, is it a matter of how the kinds of, the, is it a matter of the benefit and who benefits um, across the city? Are there other ways that we can measure ourselves? Because sometimes um, it feels like folks have a hard time. It seems to me like folks are having a hard time really doing that final walking of the talk. Um, we talk a lot about equity, but like to really get at that outcome and to know that we're there. How do we know that we're there? Do you guys have advice from your different perspective, from your different perspectives on how, um, how do we know we've actually done it right? Or, and, 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 and how do we not perpetuate this conversation and keep talking about it, but actually get there? Well, I'll jump in. I think part of it is absolutely applying metrics and using data to kind of tell the story. But I think the other component of what we see is community will tell you if you're not hitting those marks. And so I think the intentionality about making sure that we're listening to community and getting their feedback, and quite often, I don't think that happens enough. I completely agree with that. Um, community, centering community at, uh, uh, with your goals and initiatives and work uh, is important because uh, you, you'll often find when you ask community that they'll say, I know I don't want that or I don't need that, I need this. And you know, as a government official or in these organizations, we have this thought in our mind and have this framework and it looks pretty and, it, and we think we're doing good, but we have to ask the community um, what uh, uh, what is it what are their needs and and that's the the, the kind of uh, working definition of, of equity is meeting people where they're at asking folks for what they what their needs are and developing those policies practices and procedures to address the the both individual and collective needs of of, of the community so um, tracking is good um, but but we got we have to ask those hard questions and be prepared for that those um, criticisms and critiques from community about what what we need to be doing and the direction that we need to be moving into and that will help uh, help us to develop what that impact looks like and what those goals and targets and measures are. That's a great point about the community feedback. I was actually in a conversation yesterday where someone made the point that. Um, or shared the, 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 this quote that someone had shared, that someone had said to her, which is community has been saying this for like hundreds of years, like we're tired of talking, we're tired of saying it. So, um, so maybe starting with Tony, I mean, again, because of COVID, you were already going to have to do a lot of community engagement and, and the recovery and the rebuild. Um, but now, especially in light of all the 
of all the kind of enough is enough um, uh, feedback that we've gotten from the community about um, the use of uh, force by police and um, and frankly the need to transform the way policing is happening in this community is what are your plans for engaging the community? How are you thinking about doing that differently? Because in a lot of ways, I feel like what I'm seeing across the country is people say, we've been saying this for a long time, enough is enough. Like now we're just not leaving the streets until you do something about it. So how do you think about engaging people in light of, uh, in light of how the community is responding? Oh, did we lose Tony? Jai, I don't know if you want to jump in and maybe um, if, if, if she un unfreezes or... Yeah, so I think, you know, in light of how communities are responding, I think, how do you go about it doing it the right way? I don't know particularly that I have a, a perfect answer for the right way, but I think particularly if we've just seen the demonstrations and protesting, community organized itself, you know, exceptionally well to be able to lift their voice and advocate for, you know, changes within the Minneapolis Police Department and also in St. Paul. And I think being able to continue that momentum because we've never really put community at the center. I think really giving the, the captains who've organized their neighborhoods to go out and collectively protest, to start writing some of their elected officials, you know, to gather at the state capitol, et cetera. They, you know, they're resourceful, they're very strategic and being able to work with them and also lend that skill set into, you know, what are some of the other changes that we want to address within our community? And so I think that is one way that we can begin thinking about how we're going to engage them. Great. Tony, um, we lost you right when you were going to answer about how do you engage people in this moment? I swear, technology here uh, is just so tricky. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what we've done, I'll tell you what we've done. And this is in line with what the mayor, how the mayor started his administration. And um, uh, since COVID, uh, we've held these, what we call these digital roundtables. And we divided them out into four uh, different groups based off of uh, demographics. So we, we had one with the Black and African American uh, community. We had one with the American um, uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander community. We had a third one with uh, our Latinx Hispanic community. And this Thursday, actually, we'll have one with our American Indian uh, Native community. And we invited community leaders to come into the space and tell us What's, what's going on? What's happening um, post COVID? Um, and knowing that these, um, what's happening now with our various communities was already happening before, they just have been exacerbated. The disparities and inequities that were in place before COVID are now exacerbated because our community still has, doesn't have access, doesn't have access to public, to, to health, healthcare, uh, doesn't have access to, you know, um, uh, from an economic standpoint, an economic justice standpoint, uh, there's uh, opportunities for us to do better around uh, engagement. And um, we need to, to advocate and, and um, include our elected officials. So we framed out uh, the engagement, uh, the digital roundtables within these four areas, public health, uh, economic justice, um, uh, legislative advocacy, and uh, community engagement. And then we're, we've invited the community to come um, and join us in creating these subcommittees or sub work groups under our racial equity work group to um, develop a plan uh, that's community driven uh, to help um, uh, recover from, from COVID. And I would add now recover uh, from the, the civil unrest. And the slide that's up here shows you know, a few of the things that we were doing pre-COVID and civil unrest. You know, I talked about minimum wage and the college savings account and our uh, community first public safety uh, framework, but post COVID and civil unrest, because a lot of the issues are, are similar and the same, um, we created a, the St. Paul uh, Bridge Fund, which was a fund to, that um, uh, families and also businesses could apply to and receive uh, um, uh, some form of uh, financial donation to help, help their families. Um, we also initially, from the, from the, the start of, of COVID and when businesses were starting to shut down, um, we, the water department is a part of the city enterprise. And so we uh, asked the director of our water department to not uh, offer, not shut off any water. Um, and especially, you know, you have a virus going on, we need to wash your hands. <laughs> uh, that, yeah. that was an easy one. Um, there's been a lot of work with Ramsey County, as well as the uh, St. Paul Public Schools and the city on food insecurity. Those issues were already in place before, but we needed to do that, uh, pull together an effort post-COVID. 
yeah. um, childcare for our essential workers. Um, we've been collecting um, PPE. Um, you know, we've been collecting face, uh, cloth masks and, uh, you know, hand sanitizers for our community organizations and been distributing those out. Uh, we've created a site around neighbors helping neighbors. So how can, you know, the city can't do everything. Um, sometimes we think we can, and sometimes people expect that we should be doing, but it's helpful that, you know, the mayor, uh, part of our tagline of the city is building the St. Paul that works for all of us. And um, in order for us to do that, all of us have to get to work. Uh, and the mayor often says that. So neighbors helping neighbors is a part of that, that effort of all of us get, building the city that we want to, to, to thrive in. And then lastly, you know, uh, Pay It Forward is an initiative that um, was developed with um, uh, St. Paul uh, Area Chamber of Commerce, as well as the, um, as well as the um, Ramsey County and City of St. Paul coming together to provide mentorship to our uh, businesses, um, uh, entrepreneurs on how to recover and rebuild their business. So right. um, those are just a few things that we've done uh, and that we will continue to do um, with the help of the community and, the, and hopefully um, develop more initiatives that come out of the engagement efforts. Yeah, I, this is a great point to end on, a great set of points to end on. And, and it's a great reminder that COVID was disproportionately and is continues to disproportionately affect communities of color much in the same way that a lot of the the, the civil unrest and the and the manifestations have really been asking for for communities to be um, um, to be addressed re, you know for us to really rethink community policy so um, let's move to the Q and A Lily I know we have a tons of questions around what's been said so yeah yeah what are you hearing. Yeah, so um, th thanks. And, um, and I just want to start with um, a, a, a first a comment that, that someone made when you guys were talking about engagement. Um, one of the audience members said engagement with community is not just feedback, it should be collaborative co creation. Um, which I thought was was really powerful, and it really seems, Tony, like like you are doing that. Um, so, so Tony, I want to start with you. Um, there is a question from um, a uh, from a city um, asking about saying that they were pretty green to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion for their for their community, and so they're basically asking, you know, where do we start with this work? Um, how do we even begin to, to, um, to focus on diversity, equity, inclusion um, within, the, within the city? Yes, uh, it has to start with leadership. It has to start with your mayor, your city coordinator, the city council, um, you know, whoever the, 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 the designated cheerleader is for your organization. Um, it has to start there. It ha I couldn't. I would not be successful in, in my job and in the work uh, if, if if the but for the mayor. If the mayor is is going to be the first to talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion. The mayor is uh, you know the way that he set up his administration you know reflects the the reflecting the values of the city. Um, it has to be infused in your budget process. Um, but I, I would say starting with the with your electeds and starting with your your leadership. And they have to be sometimes ahead of you in the position of the chief equity or diversity officer um, talking about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And without that, um, I, I haven't seen organizations be successful in this work and standing up in office. Because if you have this person, uh, you know, not at the leadership table, you know, just off to the side in their little special office, <laughs> it's not going to work. Uh, it's not going to work. The people, uh, you know, where my position uh, is, you know, I'm a part of the mayor's cabinet. I'm at the table when we're making decisions. I'm at the table with the directors and, uh, and can be that thought partner with them. And so it's important, um, you know, for the mayor, city council, city coordinator, uh, to, or deputy mayor to be in those spaces as those active cheerleaders. And then it's also important if you wanna create a position and or an office that it needs to be, you need to have the positional authority and, yeah. and I'll use this word power uh, and not from an abuse standpoint, but the power to be able to drive this work uh, forward. And you need a budget. So yeah. this stuff takes money. Uh, and, and that's why I'm, I'm looking uh, at, at Jai. <laughs> it's helpful <laughs> to, from a philanthropic standpoint, uh, and, and, our, and our corporations and, and private sector, 
you know, the city, uh, we can only do so much. We only have a certain budget and, you know, and it, it only goes so far, but it's important to have those relationships to where, you know, I can stretch a little bit further than I would um, because I have those relationships with our, our community partners. Yeah. So, so I heard two things. So it needs to start from the top um, and then there needs to be money put, put into it. Um, you know, there needs to be teeth put into it. So, um, so that's, that's, that's great. I'm going to, I'm going to pivot a little bit. There is a question, um, around, um, public spaces, um, and how we think about, um, equity and, and the intersection of race, um, with public spaces. Of course, we saw, um, uh, we've seen over and over examples of this, but the, the example, uh, around Amy Cooper, um, and we've uh, personally in, in Miami, we've observed, um, a, an increasing police, policing in public spaces. Um, and so, um, Jai, I'll, I'll, I'll hand that to you. You know, how, how, tell us a bit about, about um, you know, the intersection of equity and, and public spaces. Yes, I'll kind of start reiterating what I said earlier in terms of the cross-sector collaboration. So in St. Paul, we have what's called our Great River Passage. And this is a big project that's a huge public space project. Um, it's um, revitalizing older infrastructure, which is our riverfront. And with that, we've been able to convene our business community, our civic community. And with that, we're also making sure that the community we want to utilize a public space is also reflected in these conversations. And so it's been a very diverse group. And I mentioned earlier the demographic shift of having a big you know, um, influx in our Somali community and our Hmong community. They're the ones leading a lot of these conversations. And I think the role that Knight has been able to play is being the convener to make sure that these individuals are at the table. And, and quite honestly, you know, I think we're all figuring out the best ways to be able to move forward and be more intentional about being inclusive. And I think one of the things that we've been able to do at night has been able to make sure that the individuals who look and reflect the community are at the table helping to shape these conversations. And so I will say, you know, in that aspect, that's one of the ways that we've been thinking about our public space work because, you know, public space hasn't been a main strategy in St. Paul, but we've been able to glean and learn a lot from our other cities like Akron and Philadelphia. We've been doing some really great stuff there. And part of the things that we learned is making sure that everybody is at the table. So as we are continue to do that work in St. Paul, we're able to ask those questions to say, you know, is the community at the table? And when we look around and saying, okay, if they're not making sure we're intentional about making sure those folks are there. Great. Um, so there's a couple questions in the Q and A around this issue of defunding police. Um, Tony, from the city's perspective, how are you addressing that? community demands. And the question also um, focuses on uh, if you if there's an opportunity to rebalance the budget, um, how wh what are the other social services that that funding could be um, could be put towards. Um, so what's the dialogue in the administration about about that. So not, I want to be careful and not jumping in front of the, our mayor because he's done a lot of, um, you know, uh, uh, interviews on on this, uh, but I have been a part of the conversation around it and, and, and with him and the administration. Um, you know, we, short answer is that we're, we're uh, figuring out our long, longer term strategy, especially from a budget, you know, a budget standpoint. Um, yeah. uh, the budget for us is the annual budget. And so we're always in budget season, I feel like it's only a, probably a couple of months where we're not talking about the budget. But especially during this time, um, we, we are. What I, um, what I will reflect on is, is what we, what I talked about a little bit earlier, which is our community first public safety um, uh, work. And that work actually started pre-COVID, pre-George Floyd and the civil unrest. Um, the mayor in the fall of 2019, uh, and in response to the uh, uptick of shooting uh, deaths that were taking place in St. Paul, um, asked, proposed to the council for a budget amendment to, um, to uh, further support from a financial standpoint, our community first public safety um, framework. And that includes um, more than just law enforcement. How do we build a safe community from housing? How do we um, build a safe community by making sure that our folks are employed and, and youth employment? Um, we now have a community first public safety um, uh, director in our uh, parks department because parks is one of our most public facing departments and interact quite a bit with our youth. And as we were looking at the data of who, who is committing these crimes and who was involved in, in these shooting deaths. It was our young people. Um, and, yeah. and so we wanted to engage uh, uh, our staff that has that lens of, of our youth 
so to speak, and, and having the, that insight with our youth to help lead the work. Um, we have uh, what we've developed, and a part of this, this funding would go towards our community ambassadors. We have community folks who have been doing this work, you know, for 20 something years on the streets in St. Paul, uh, connecting with our, our black youth, uh, black, uh, black men who are, are on the streets and, uh, you know, they serve as our kind of liaisons or our t initial touch point to what's going on in the community and could help um, divert and maybe advise or mentor uh, our, our, our youth on, um, you know, other ways that they can engage in, in, in to participate in, in activities such as our parks and, and our libraries. So we've, uh, you know, part of this uh, community first public safety uh, strategy is to further in, uh, fund our community ambassadors. Um, I mentioned housing before. There's some work uh, going on that, and that that group has been stood up, um, you know, pre George Floyd, um, but also it was post COVID. You know, how do we utilize uh, that group? Because, you know, it's a public health um, concern, uh, especially for our youth who are used to going to basketball courts or as an outlet. And how do we engage with them to talk about? Uh, the importance of social distancing and wearing a mask and maybe you can't play basketball in the way that you did before um, but how do we um, how do you still gain that that, that outlet um, without uh, and, and managing and maintaining social distancing and physical distancing um, so and those are just a few of the strategies around our uh, community first public safety uh, framework which we, we again we started before but now um, will continue to to be bolstered up given um, the with the, the murder of George Floyd. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think it's interesting to me that you guys have, I mean, that this administration has been really on, on the forefront of trying creative ways to really address a lot of these issues even before um, George Floyd's death. Um, you know, one point that I know just from Jai, um, the reason, I mean, it's definitely been this administration but what was so critical, Jai, can you tell us a little bit, I mean, this is kind of like rewinding a bit to the context, but what was so critical about, or what was the, the big difference about this administration that I think really sort of catalyzed a lot of this change? Yeah, so I will, you know, be quite honest, when I came into this role, it was at the end of a previous administration ending. So, you know, I think one of the unique opportunities that presented itself with this administration is one, it's the first African-American mayor. So as we talk about the demographic shift, you know, he's able to resonate a bit more with some of the challenges that our communities are facing, particularly our communities of color. And then for me, you know, his intentionality around really making it a community oriented process when it comes to electing the individual leaders of his apartments, et cetera. And so it also created the opportunity for us to have more open dialogue around things that Knight sees working really well in some of our other cities and you know, opportunities that we can help, you know, connect some thought leaders who are doing some great work in Akron or in Charlotte or in Philadelphia with some of our leadership here in local city governments. I'll say, I think that quite honestly has been one of the bigger successes of this administration is its intentionality to say, we don't know everything, but we want to learn as much as we can and we want to invite as many people to the table to be able to shape the way that we're moving this community forward. That's a great point. And Lily, you've got another question from the Q&A. The one thing I will say is some of the questions we've gotten around the DEI and the leadership point to your to your um, uh, advice, Tony, has been um, how do you do this when you don't have an African-American mayor? And I think the fact that he's also really young and also kind of like in the like, I feel like he knows this community and he knows this audience really well. But but how do you do it when you don't have that level of leadership? And when, frankly, you don't have people of color in your leadership team, um, that's been a question. But Lily, you've uh, so I'll leave that out there to answer. But Lily, you've got a great question from the sure. from the Q and A. Sure. Um, and, and so and, and we're running uh, we're running out of time. So just quickly, Tony. Um, I thought a really important question is, is how do you structure consistent, accurate city communications that equitably reach all citizens, especially during this, this long time of sheltering in place? Um, is there a frequency that, that seems critical? Sorry, taking myself off of mute. Um, 
uh, you know, what we have done, uh, most cities have, especially larger cities, has a um, emergency management or emergency operation uh, uh, department. And we have stood up our emergency operations center. And uh, that is comprised of our uh, staff and our leadership team. Uh, and a part of that has been a communication team. And we've set up our, our COVID, uh, we have a COVID-19 uh, site on our website, uh, as well as we're sending out a newsletter for those who want to subscribe to, to what's going on in the city of St. Paul in general will receive this. Um, but it's, all, it's also on, it's on our website. It's a, in the format of a newsletter. And we utilize social media quite heavily. Um, you will see our mayor on Facebook. You'll see our mayor posting on Twitter, Twitter or Instagram. Uh, and then we are copy and pasting all of those links and linking those uh, sites onto our, um, our Facebook uh, page as well. And so the frequency is, I would say, is weekly. Um, but as things come up and change, we know that we have a platform to be able to, to make additions or changes to it uh, if, if needed uh, on a daily basis. Great, thanks. Uh, so Jai and Tony, thank you so much for joining us. As Lily mentioned, unfortunately, we've run out of time. The hour has passed by really quickly. Um, we'd love to end it with having each of you just give us like one big sort of uh, sort of outrageous goal to think about or, or, or um, as we leave this conversation. So maybe starting with Jai, um, I mean, what do you think is a big takeaway that you're hoping the audience gets from this um, discussion? I think just given everything that we've seen happening across our country, you know, the last two weeks, I think this is really a defining moment in history for our generation. And I, you know, quite honestly, as it resonates a bit more deeply to me personally, being an African American male, as I listen to stories from my grandfather about, you know, what he did to show up and, you know, lend a hand during the civil rights movement, I can't help but think about what is it that I'm doing. And so as I think about my role and my platform with philanthropy, I think it's to be able to elevate these conversations, elevate the voices that don't have an opportunity to be heard and really aggressively move that needle forward. So for me, that's one thing that I also encourage folks who are listening is in your respective capacity, you know, what can you double down on? You know, whose voice can you give an opportunity to be lifted? Thank you, Jai. And Tony? Um, so much. Uh, you know, I think that I totally agree with Jai. You know, if um, yesterday wasn't the time for you to act. Uh, now is the time. Uh, we, uh, it's, a, it's a global movement. These issues are not new, especially to, to folks like Jai and I uh, who have personal experiences and also have families who, and, and grandparents and aunts and uncles who've had experiences in the space of being treated differently uh, because of what they look like um, and having negative uh, uh, interactions with our law enforcement. And so uh, the time is now to act. And I, I think uh, if it wasn't before you were acting, um, the, the time is now and uh, be intentional around the work. So you may not have that chief equity officer. You may not have a, the first black mayor uh, or, or the first Latinx or uh, native uh, uh, mayor or elected official in your respective jurisdiction. Um, human resources is a space where you can uh, effectuate change internally. Uh, your chief of police, um, your you know, it's, it's starting a a, a a smaller group, uh, engaging your community um, is it's the space. Let the community tell the elected, who may not be down or woke or whatever the fir the terminology is, and empower your community to 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 raise up uh, and 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 uh, request and demand for change to happen. So, but but don't let this be another uh, short social media post. Uh, that 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 fades away. Um, this needs to be some. This has been a global effort and movement, and and it needs to continue. And we need everyone to be kind of on the ground working. Well, Tony, I I don't know that there's any other um, better way to end it than on that and on that note. I know that. Um, for Lily and I, it's been such a great pleasure to have you both. Um, Jai is our uh, is is one of our partners in 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 this work here at Knight Foundation, and it's so great to connect with you, Tony, um, to really see what's happening in the community and and to learn about all these very concrete ways in which you guys have already started to. Um, to do the work of um, of transforming St. Paul. Um, so, uh, Lily, thank you, um, thank you for your um, questions and 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 fielding the questions from the audience. And um, 
for everybody on, thank you for joining us. Um, stay tuned for next week's episode information and please keep the discussion going. We encourage you to give us feedback. This is a dialogue. This is a journey that we're all on. And as Tony said, let's not just stop um, uh, today, but let's keep doing the work um, tomorrow. So please, um, thank you very much and uh, stay safe. And we will uh, see you all next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank you.